Hello, uh, my name is Adnan Bhutta. I'm the uh, professor and division head of pediatric critical care medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And it is my uh, honor to be invited by the uh, Jinnah Sindh Medical University Alumni Association of North America to talk to you all about uh, diagnosis and management of pediatric sepsis. The objectives of my talk <clears throat> are to briefly describe the epidemiology of uh, sepsis globally, as well as uh, in particular in North America, uh, as we have data on it. Uh, then talk uh, uh, briefly about the definitions uh, of sepsis and related uh, uh, entities, uh, you know, how it presents clinically, uh, the pathogenesis, and then uh, overview of the treatment strategies uh, of pediatric sepsis. Sepsis, the word, is derived from uh, septicus uh, in Latin and septicos in Greek, uh, both of which mean putrefication, uh, which in Urdu would be equivalent to uh, galna, which is gal jati hai, sar jati hai. So that, that is what uh, sepsis means. And historically, uh, anytime there was uh, sepsis, the mortality associated with that uh, had been extremely high. Even as uh, uh, late as in the 1960s in the United States, the mortality of uh, sepsis in children with gram-negative rod infections was 98%. So uh, almost every child who developed gram-negative rod infection uh, succumbed to it. Uh, but uh, this was the era when uh, intensive care units started developing uh, in the United States and in the Western world. And over a period of time, uh, the mortality from sepsis has gradually reduced. Globally, uh, the mortality from sepsis is still much higher than other forms of uh, mechanisms of death. So this is a, a graph uh, from, uh, taken from the uh, Global uh, uh, Burden of Diseases uh, article published in uh, The Lancet uh, two years ago. Uh, what it shows you is that uh, mortality related to sepsis and infections uh, is still much higher than, more, than sepsis related illnesses secondary to injuries and other non communicable diseases. The peak period of um, uh, mortality in, uh, in sepsis is uh, in the early neonatal uh, time period, uh, as well as, so in the early neonatal uh, and late neonatal time period. And then it gradually declines over the next uh, years and decades until there's an, another little upswing uh, late in our lives. Uh, as uh, sepsis starts to take a uh, toll again uh, uh, on, um, on mortality numbers. Globally, as you can imagine, uh, sepsis uh, is much more uh, likely to be prevalent in lower and middle income countries. So the darker blue colors uh, are uh, countries where uh, there's a much higher incidence of sepsis. So in uh, most of Africa, South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, as well as uh, uh, to some degree, Latin America have much higher incidence of sepsis compared to uh, Europe and North America. Uh, similarly, the estimated deaths due to sepsis are again much, much higher in Africa, uh, South and Southeast Asia, as well as Latin America. If you look at these maps, there's probably a, a significant amount of overlay between uh, mort sepsis and mortality from sepsis with global poverty. So uh, areas and countries where there is uh, uh, higher incidence of sepsis happen to be the same countries and regions where there is more poverty. It probably speaks to lack of facilities, lack of uh, good uh, emergency uh, care, as well as uh, possibly uh, a lack of uh, intensive care unit infrastructures. Uh, 
all of which uh, are likely contributors to um, increased mortality from uh, this uh, mechanism. In the United States, uh, again, the uh, highest incidence of uh, sepsis per thousand population is in children less than one year of age. Uh, the uh, incidence is thought to be around five per thousand population uh, with a uh, national estimate of cases every year of more than 20,000. Uh, and the case fatality rate uh, even nowadays is around 10 uh, percent. As uh, children uh, grow older, uh, the incidence uh, goes down, and the number of uh, and the case fatality also slightly decreases. Uh, so, uh, sepsis again remains one of the leading causes of mortality, uh, not uh, not in not just uh, 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 in low and middle income countries, but it also in uh, the more developed economies, uh, such as in the United States. The, uh, uh, the number of admissions to the pediatric ICU, uh, secondary to severe sepsis and septic shock, constitute almost 25% of all admissions, uh, at least in the United States. So, uh, and if you look uh, and uh, study carefully, uh, more than 80% of all admissions to the pediatric ICU in the United States have evidence for uh, what is called systemic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS. There's been a series of uh, studies that have uh, taken place in the United uh, States which have shown that there has been a, a steady increase in the number of patients admitted with severe sepsis uh, between 1995 and 2005. So in 1995, the incidence of severe sepsis uh, admissions uh, in the United States was thought to be around uh, almost close to 10 uh, or a little less than 10,000. Um, and by 2005, uh, this incidence had almost doubled. Um, and so, the, so you can see the prevalence went up from 0.56 to 0.89. Uh, there are probably uh, many factors that have led to this increase in sepsis. Uh, one is likely due to increased recognition uh, of children uh, getting admitted early uh, with uh, sepsis uh, rather than uh, ho hopefully rather than dying at home uh, or dying um, in the emergency room. There is also uh, likely, uh, at least in the United States, an increasing uh, number of uh, uh, patients who have chronic medical illnesses such as uh, congenital heart disease or, or uh, illnesses related to premature uh, birth. And those children, though they may survive their initial um, uh, prematurity or congenital heart disease, uh, are certainly uh, prone to developing uh, infections uh, because of secondary immunocompromise uh, or their med uh, medications that they may be on. Uh, so there is certainly a component of uh, those uh, patients uh, presenting repeatedly to hos uh, for hospitalizations. So, so I just wanted to go over uh, a case uh, with you that uh, you may have uh, seen similar cases in your uh, clinical experience uh, over the last few years. Uh, this uh, vignette uh, has a patient who is six weeks old, uh, previously healthy, presents to the emergency room with a three-day history of nasal congestion, cough, and decreased appetite. Uh, the patient's parents report a subjective fever for two days, decreased urine output for 24 hours, and increased lethargy and inability to feed since, this, uh, since the morning of uh, presentation. Uh, when you examine the patient, the patient's heart rate is 200 per minute. Respiratory rate is 80 breaths per minute. Uh, patient is febrile up to 39 degrees. Uh, and the blood pressure is uh, 54 over 33. Uh, patient has significantly increased work of breathing. Uh, the pulses are weak to palpation and the capillary reveal is five seconds. The suspected diagnosis is, drum roll, severe sepsis. Uh, and so I wanted to go over 
uh, some fundamental definitions uh, that will be useful uh, for you to remember uh, uh, because uh, there is a certain degree of overlap in some of these definitions, but they are all uh, they all had carry different meaning. So the first definition that you should be uh, uh, accustomed to is a phenomena called systemic inflammatory response syndrome. The systemic inflammatory response uh, syndrome can occur due to a variety of severe clinical insults. So it can certainly happen in children who have an infection, uh, bacterial infections, viral infections. Nowadays, everybody's talking about COVID. Uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome can certainly happen secondary to COVID as well. Um, but it can also happen due to other uh, systemic uh, insults, such as uh, children who suffer trauma, uh, children who may suffer from burn injuries, uh, children who may suffer from uh, 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 pancreatitis, children who undergo major surgery such as abdominal surgery or cardiac surgery, all can develop systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So the, what, what the syndrome, uh, um, uh, the way it manifests in children is that they may be febrile with either a temperature greater than 38.5 or they may be hypothermic, in which case the temperature may be less than 36 degrees centigrade. Uh, they ha they uh, usually have tachycardia, which uh, by defini definition is two standard deviations above the mean resting heart rate for that patient's age. Uh, conversely, they can also be bradycardic which means that their heart rate is less than the 10th percentile of the resting mean heart rate for age. Tachypnea is uh, a high respiratory rate. Uh, so if the respiratory rate is over the 90th percentile for age, uh, or uh, if you decide uh, to intubate uh, these patients and put them on mechanical ventilation, then th that by default, uh, gives them a point uh, towards being recognized as somebody with systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And then the, uh, another common feature is alterations in the uh, white blood cell count. So if the white blood cell count is high, if it's more than 12,000, or if it's actually very low, uh, less than 4,000, uh, or if you have more than 10% uh, um, uh, bands or immature uh, polymorphonucleosides, uh, then that's another sign of uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So how? Uh, so I just wanted to show this slide, and hopefully you guys will uh, have uh, access to uh, these numbers, uh, in, uh, hopefully in written format. Otherwise, you can certainly uh, print a copy of this particular slide. Uh, but this gives the average uh, respiratory rate, heart rates, and systolic blood pressure by age. Uh, so you can see for uh, a neonate who's less than who's less than one day of age, the average respiratory rate is 40 to 60. The average heart rate varies from 93 to 154. Uh, systolic blood pressure varies from 60 to 140. So each age group, uh, these numbers change. Uh, we know that uh, babies have a much higher heart rate and as uh, we, we grow older, our heart rates uh, tend to start slowing down. Same thing with respiratory rate. Uh, so always remember that the, uh, you can't uh, treat a uh, one day old the same way that you treat a one year old uh, because their normal values are going to, uh, to vary by age. So, so we talked about systemic inflammatory response. Uh, let's talk about what uh, it means uh, when you say somebody has an infection. Infection is a microbial phenomena characterized by an inflammatory response to the presence of microorganisms or the invasion of normally sterile host tissue by these organisms. So these organisms, again, could be of any type. They could be vi uh, viruses, bacteria, uh, fungus, uh, pa uh, parasites. Uh, so all of those uh, uh, infections by, the, by microorganisms uh, or all of those uh, are infections uh, caused by different microorganisms. Bacteremia is a particular type of an infection in which you can detect the presence of uh, viable uh, or live bacteria in the blood. So what's the difference between um, uh, infection and sepsis? 
sepsis is our response to the infection, right? So infection is uh, a microorganism enters the bloodstream. Sepsis is how our body responds to that infection. So two or more of the conditions that I listed earlier under the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, um, uh, which may result as a uh, secondary to the infection, uh, is uh, the uh, is our body's response to the infection, and it is called sepsis. Severe sepsis is sepsis associated with organ dysfunction, hypoperfusion, and hypotension. Uh, perfusion abnormalities can include lactic acidosis, oliguria, or an acute change in mental status. Uh, so these are the signs that uh, you know your teachers will always tell you to look for uh, in any uh, child that you are examining uh, in the clinic or in the emergency room. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you check for their pulses, uh, for their capillary refill, and for their mental status. And if there's any concern, uh, then certainly the diagnosis of severe sepsis can be made. So what's the difference between severe sepsis and septic shock? Septic shock is when you actually treat the severe sepsis um, and you don't see a response. So for example, uh, the, in the example that we gave of that six week old who presented uh, to the ER uh, with a low blood pressure of 54 over 33, uh, you, if you give them a volume bolus with normal saline or uh, lactated ringers uh, and their hypotension does not resolve, uh, then that uh, constitutes uh, septic shock. Another uh, related uh, definition is that of multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, uh, which uh, is typified uh, by the presence of, uh, or a prolonged presence uh, over many, many days of altered function in a acutely ill patient, uh, such that uh, you cannot maintain homeostasis of physiologic balance uh, without intervention. So, what is, what is an example of uh, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome? So uh, if sepsis leads to uh, what we uh, call acute respiratory distress syndrome or uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, such that you need uh, 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 to be on a ventilator just to be able to breathe, uh, then that's pulmonary organ dysfunction. If you have uh, low blood pressures uh, such that uh, you cannot maintain normal blood pressures without being on uh, inotropic or uh, vasoactive uh, therapy, uh, adrenaline or noradrenaline, uh, then that is uh, known, as, uh, that is uh, car uh, cardiac dysfunction uh, or cardiovascular dysfunction. Um, and that's, uh, that's another uh, organ that is now uh, affected. So similarly, you can go organ by organ, system by system, CNS, hematologic, uh, GI, and all of these organs can be affected in sepsis. Uh, so that is an Im important um, uh, concept to remember, because if you do have severe sepsis uh, and or septic shock, uh, then many of these patients can develop multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Uh, so this is sort of uh, a Venn diagram to show you what I was talking about earlier, uh, that you can certainly have uh, infection, uh, which can be caused by a variety of different uh, types of pathogens, such as bacteria, fun fungi, parasites, viruses. Uh, and uh, there's, uh, if, if you have, uh, if you meet the definition of SIRS, which is systemic inflammatory response syndrome in the presence of infection, then, then you have sepsis, which is this pink uh, shaded area. If you have SIRS because of other causes other than infection, such as trauma, burns, or pancreatitis, uh, could be other causes as well, um, then that uh, is SIRS related to, or secondary to these causes, not from an infection. So the common bacteria that are associated with sepsis uh, that we usually think about are 
uh, meningococcus uh, or Neisseria meningitis, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, which can be either uh, resistant to methicillin or sensitive to methicillin, uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, although the incidence has uh, gone down, at least in the uh, most of the high income countries because of uh, the uh, ready availability of pneumococcal vaccine. Um, group B streptococcus, in, especially in neonates, in the, uh, both in the early phase as well as uh, sometimes in late uh, onset. And then gram negative uh, ro uh, rod infections, such as Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa and other uh, enteric rods, are all common bacterial uh, causes of uh, sepsis. You can certainly also, like I said, uh, have uh, sepsis secondary to uh, viral infections, such as uh, RSV. Uh, we usually think of RSV as a respiratory virus, but it can certainly affect every single organ of the body and, and can cause a general generalized systemic uh, response, uh, systemic inflammatory response or, or viral sepsis. Uh, influenza and herpes and enterovirus can all uh, also lead to generalized illness uh, and sepsis. Again, fungal and parasitic infections occur mostly in uh, immunocompromised uh, hosts, but can occasionally happen uh, in uh, non-immunocompromised uh, children uh, as well. So septic shock uh, has uh, features of all the three shock states. So when you talk about when we talk about shock, People usually talk about hypovolemic shock, uh, which occurs in conditions such as diarrhea, where you have a, a lack of um, to, uh, total body water or lack of uh, total body fluid uh, uh, because from diarrhea and vomiting. Uh, you can also have cardiogenic shock, where there's a problem with the uh, with the pump, and so you have uh, decreased uh, oxygen and uh, oxygen delivery to uh, their peripheral tissue. And then uh, another, uh, uh, the third type of shock is distributive shock. So distributive shock occurs, uh, uh, we usually see it happen is in uh, conditions uh, such as spinal cord injury in which you have vaso, uh, peripheral vasoplegia, uh, which means that the tone of your uh, peripheral vessels uh, decreases such that you have a very low tone and all the blood uh, sort of pools in your uh, peripheral vessels. And when you take blood pressures, they are uh, low because uh, blood has a uh, pool in, in these blood in the, in the periphery. So these are the three main sort of physiologic uh, uh, classifications of uh, shock. And, and that's a whole different uh, talk uh, that hopefully somebody will give you, uh, or maybe I will give you at some point uh, if, if nobody else has. Um, but septic shock is interesting because it has features of all of these three different physiologic states. So uh, you can certainly be hypovolemic. You can certainly have your cardiac function uh, affected or uh, low cardiac function. And you can you, there's certainly a component of what's known as distributive shock. Uh, that's when you see patients who uh, you, you, are, you classically describe as being in warm shock. So they have really good pul uh, pulses and uh, uh, perfusion. When you check for their cap refill, they, uh, it'll be brisk. But when you uh, check their heart rate, it may be very, very high. When you check a blood pressure, it may be uh, quite low. Uh, that's a condition known as warm shock. Uh, that is in contrast to what we called cold shock, which is the more classic form of shock that we think of in which you have cold, clammy skin uh, because of peripheral vasoconstriction um, in association with, and you have other organ dysfunction in association with uh, uh, high heart rates and high uh, respiratory rates and uh, possibly low blood pressures. Um, and that's the more, uh, and that's usually more associated with either hypovolemia or cardiogenic shock, uh, and that's the more classic uh, cold shock. Most children with septic shock uh, may go through a phase early in their uh, shock state where they may be in warm shock, but then they quickly sort of progress into the more classic cold shock. Uh, 
most patients who present with septic shock have uh, some respiratory abnormalities. They may have uh, just tachypnea as the initial manifestation, uh, but they can also have, have significant amount of uh, respiratory distress. And like I mentioned earlier, can certainly have um, uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema or uh, ARDS, which is uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, but in addition to the respiratory abnormalities, like I mentioned before, you essentially can have a dysfunction of any and all organs of the body. The pathogenesis of sepsis depends on three factors. Uh, the virulence of the microbe uh, that you're dealing with, uh, the response of the host or if you're the person who's getting infected, your response. And then the, the inflammatory cascade that is inducted by the interaction of the microbe with the host. Um, so everybody these days is an expert on the virulence of uh, COVID uh, or SARS-CoV-2, which is the actual uh, virus. Uh, and, you know, and how virulent it is uh, such that the uh, in uh, the case fatality rates of um, SARS-CoV-2 is almost 10 times that of uh, influenza virus. Uh, and so it is uh, probably one of the most virulent uh, infections. Uh, and and uh, it is also the, the fact that it can spread so quickly from person to person uh, makes it uh, particularly lethal. So microbial virulence really is uh, dependent on five stages. It's, it's the adherence of the organism to uh, the, the body inside, so to the, to the mucosal surface. Uh, then it proliferates locally uh, in the mucosa uh, where it can cause local tissue damage uh, and then invasion of host tissue. And, and finally, from that local um, uh, spread, it then spreads far and wide uh, into different parts of the body. So again, just taking the example of uh, COVID-19, we know that uh, when we uh, breathe in uh, these viruses, they tend to deposit in our upper respiratory tract infection, but within uh, minutes of getting deposited, they start to multiply very rapidly and they almost double their numbers in every 15 to 20 minutes. And as they start uh, doubling their numbers, they start to damage uh, the uh, mucosal surface in the upper respiratory tract and then migrate down into our lungs and, different, and all different parts of our body. Um, and so their proliferation and invasion uh, is particularly uh, uh, quick and, and certainly very widespread. Uh, dissemination. Uh, like I said, the host response is uh, is an also an essential piece of uh, how the uh, uh, how sick we get. Uh, so talking about uh, the host response uh, nowadays, everybody has become an immunologist after having to deal with uh, uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, but we know that the components of our immune system include. Uh, uh, cells, uh, including T, uh, uh, T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, macrophages, uh, the complement system, and the numerous uh, cytokines and chemokines uh, that signal back and forth between these uh, different types of uh, cells. Uh, the, in, in children, especially in young, ch young children or infants, uh, they are more susceptible uh, to infections because uh, they have a decreased T cell function. They have an inability of uh, their B cells to undergo uh, switch uh, from uh, one type to, uh, to type two. Uh, they have lower uh, antibody production from their B cells. Uh, they also have lower alternate complement pathway activity uh, and their phagocytes uh, or uh, what's also what, what are also known as natural killer cells uh, also have quantitative and qualitative deficits uh, compared to uh, older children and adults. So by definition, 
babies are relatively immunocompromised uh, compared to older uh, children and adults. And so that makes them more susceptible to infections. That's why babies get more uh, viral infections and have higher rates of uh, mortality associated with sepsis. And then the third thing that we talked about, by, which is important in the pathogenesis of sepsis, is induction of the inflammatory cascade. So for uh, an infection to happen, uh, you first have uh, a bacteria, it could also be a virus or any other microorganism that is presented uh, to uh, the cells, the white cells in the body. Uh, so, and there are uh, multiple ways that these are uh, presented uh, to uh, or attached to these different cells uh, through lipoproteins uh, or entry uh, of the bacterial DNA into these cells. Uh, other forms of attachments uh, to these cells, and then they attach to neutrophils, to mast cells, to um, lymphocytes, um, and then these cells all get activated and produce a variety of cytokines, such as pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as TNF-alpha or interleukin-1, or anti-inflammatory uh, mediators such as IL-10 and interleukin-1 receptor antagonists and many other functions. So these pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, they uh, work to sort of act uh, and, uh, and uh, neutralize the uh, bacterial uh, antigens, and they are essentially produce inflammation. Uh, and inflammation uh, is a body's response, uh, and a moderate amount of inflammation uh, provides a beneficial uh, alarming mechanism so that the cells of the body uh, will gather around and uh, either kill off the bacteria or neutralize uh, or viruses or neutralize them. The anti-inflammatory mediators um, also kick in and, and they uh, are there to control the effects of the inflammation being produced by the pro-inflammatory mediators. So the body itself produces both uh, molecules that produce inflammation, but then also produces molecules to dampen down the inflammation so that the response remains localized. And the, the benefit is uh, that you have, you know, we, we see millions and millions of uh, bacteria and other or microorganisms uh, in, in our system every day and not, uh, uh, and we don't get sick every day or every second of our they because the the uh, uh, the inflammatory response is contained to wherever the bacteria or pathogens are. However, if there is uh, too much of the pro -infl uh, pro inflammatory response, that can lead to serious deleterious effects such as organ dysfunction and all the signs of uh, sepsis that we talked about earlier. Uh, similarly, anti-inflammatory response then that can lead to uh, patients becoming susceptible to nosocomial infections. So that means that they, uh, their, their immune levels go down or white, white cell uh, lymphocytes and neutrophil levels all go down and the body just then becomes more uh, likely to develop infections from uh, uh, funguses or other uh, organisms that call, cause hospital acquired infections. Uh, and uh, interesting ways, sort of how uh, you know the the these uh, um, microorganism inflammation works is all these cells that respond to inflammation travel to the site of inflammation uh, by in the bloodstream, and in the blood they eventually start sticking to these to the endothelial uh, lining. Uh, so. The uh, blood vessels, as you know, the wall is made of endothelium. Eventually, these cells line, um, stick to the endothelium, and then migrate through uh, these intracellular gaps, uh, junctions between the uh, between the endothelial, migrate out into the interstitial space, where they continue to um, uh, get to the site of inflammation. So, the, you know, nature has a very interesting mechanism of how. Uh, we are able to fend off and fight these uh, viruses and bacteria every single day. 
um, there is once they get uh, to um, uh, the offending organism, uh, there are many other molecules that uh, are released by uh, uh, white these white cells, uh, uh, predominantly uh, lymphocytes as well as neutrophils, uh, which then go and act on the uh, bacterial uh, uh, RNA and DNA and, and turn uh, turn off or uh, help kill uh, these microorganisms. We also know that sepsis has uh, is very intricately linked with coagulation system. Um, so any uh, pro-inflammatory response uh, as a res result of sepsis also causes alterations uh, in the coagulation system so that um, you uh, most of the time you become more prone to clotting uh, or so blood becomes more prone to clotting uh, and the consum and sometimes the consumption of the different clotting factors as well as platelets uh, then makes uh, leads to what uh, is known as disseminated intravascular coagulation or a coagulopathy or DIC. And that uh, uh, then uh, puts them at risk for uh, bleeding. So we see this uh, also again, uh, talking about COVID playing out uh, in a lot of the sick uh, patients where they develop blood clots uh, throughout uh, different parts of the uh, body, including the lungs and other uh, blood vessels, uh, where clots form, and a lot of the uh, deaths that occurred, uh, especially early on, uh, were happening because of these blood uh, clots forming in uh, in the lungs and other parts of our body. So I was, uh, like I mentioned, uh, uh, the uh, body has a normal response to any infection by causing uh, an increase uh, in the immune response or a pro-inflammatory response. Uh, that's our normal way of dealing, um, uh, or normal way of this blue line that's dealing with uh, an infection. If you, we have a too high of a response or too robust of a response or a hyper uh, immune response, then that can lead uh, in itself to uh, organ damage. Uh, again, giving you the example of our current COVID pandemic, uh, we do see this part as well, where there's a robust uh, inflammatory response syndrome and organ dysfunction and organ damage uh, to different parts uh, of our body. Uh, at the same time as this hyperimmune or, uh, response goes up, the body also starts working on trying to dampen down the inflammation. And that's the um, anti-inflammatory response syndrome. And normally uh, you, you have this curve where you initially have a pro-inflammatory response. And then over the course of two or three days, uh, the anti-inflammatory molecules uh, become more predominant uh, till about a week. And then they slowly get back to baseline. And that's when you recover. If you have an exaggerated uh, uh, anti-inflammatory response syndrome, then that uh, by itself uh, can uh, lead to, like I said, nosocomial infections uh, and uh, lead to uh, death uh, or at least uh, prolonged organ dysfunction. So uh, I just wanted to briefly talk about um, the management of sepsis, the management of uh, the sort of the main goals of uh, management of sepsis are, are initial resuscitation, uh, which usually in includes uh, stabilizing patients with fluids. Uh, the second is the removal of uh, nidus of infection. So if there is a known nidus, such as an abscess, you want to remove that. Uh, then the third uh, and more important piece is supportive care of all the affected systems. So you have to quickly try and gauge which organs are involved in, the, in, the, in sepsis. So uh, screen for kidney damage, liver damage, uh, cardiac damage, CNS damage, uh, muscle damage. Um, and if you see them, then uh, therapies to support those different organs may need to be instituted. And then the last piece is uh, if 
as you detect complications from sepsis, then you have to treat uh, those complications. So this is from uh, uh, the uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine, uh, with, uh, which has uh, given uh, guidelines for our clinical practice parameters for hemodynamic support of uh, pediatric patients in sepsis. Uh, these are freely available from, uh, uh, from the internet. Uh, but briefly, I will say that the, uh, as soon as somebody uh, comes to you who you think may be in sepsis, the first thing is obviously recognizing that somebody is septic. You do that by uh, by recognizing that they have altered mental status, altered perfusion, altered vital signs. Uh, and as soon as they walk into your emergency room, you should be, uh, place them on oxygen and you should try and establish um, a, a, a IV to give them fluids. Then within five minutes of uh, their presentation, uh, you should have started pushing uh, fluid uh, about 20 cc's per kilo of isotonic saline, uh, which uh, at least in the United States, we repeat uh, uh, quickly uh, up to 60 cc's per kilo. Interestingly, uh, studies done in Africa show that if you give this much fluid, so up to 60 cc's per kilo, that you actually increase the mortality uh, because uh, if you don't, uh, if you give a lot of fluid, then it is quite likely that you will end up with uh, lung dysfunction, pulmonary edema. Uh, and if you are not capable of uh, or do not have the capacity to deal with pulmonary edema by intubating patients or providing them positive pressure uh, through a back valve mask or other such devices, um, then you will actually uh, increase the mortality by pushing this much fluid. So in if you were working in a small rural uh, area which doesn't have ventilators, then you want to push less fluid. So instead of 20 cc's per kilo boluses, you may want to give 10 cc's per kilo. Instead, instead of giving up to 60 cc's, you may want to give up to 20 or 30 cc's total uh, to see if that if you get a good response. The next step is if the shock is not reversed, is to begin inotrope therapy. So. Um, and that is started through the IV or IO. Uh, you may have to intubate uh, some of these patients, uh, especially if you have access to mechanical ventilation. If you don't have access to mechanical ventilation, then at least put them on oxygen uh, and provide them therapy that way. Uh, the classic teaching is if they have a cold shock, which is the more common type of shock, then start uh, dopamine in children. Um, or, uh, or start epinephrine uh, or adrenaline uh, as the second option. If they present in what is described as warm shock, uh, then uh, instead of starting dopamine or epinephrine, you may want to consider starting nor epinephrine or nor adrenaline. Uh, but regardless, within 60 minutes of the arrival of these uh, patients to your facility, uh, you should have uh, done all of these things uh, to try and reverse the shock because the quicker you can do it, the better the outcomes. Uh, you can also consider starting them on hydrocortisone um, as a therapy for shock. Uh, and then you should be making arrangements for them to go to an ICU if an ICU is available uh, for these children to go to. Um, in the ICU, obviously, uh, there needs to be continuing management with fluids, epinephrine, uh, with efforts to maintain SCVO2 means mixed venous uh, uh, oxygen saturation, uh, which should be uh, at least uh, in or around 70%. Uh, these children may require blood to keep their hemoglobin greater than 10. <clears throat> uh, and you may, then may also involve using other uh, vasoactive agents uh, such as uh, uh, melranone or uh, nipride uh, and, and such. Uh, if you have uh, cold uh, shock with low blood pressure, uh, again, uh, all of these steps plus adding uh, inotropes such as dibutamine or melranone. And then if you have uh, warm shock, uh, then in addition to your fluid and, and norepinephrine uh, therapy, you may want to consider adding uh, vasopressin uh, if it's available. 
um, as as another option, vasopressin acts on uh, specific receptors which are not beta receptors or alpha receptors uh, or catechol uh, catechol receptors uh, such as uh, such as those that uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine work on. If you still have persistent uh, catecholamine resistant um, shock, uh, then you want to make sure uh, that you are not dealing with somebody who has a pericardial effusion or pneumothorax or high intra-abdominal pressures. And if you have any of these conditions, then you may need to correct this by draining the pericardium, by draining the pneumothorax or by opening up the abdomen to uh, relieve the intra-abdominal pressures. Uh, and then more sophisticated uh, um, cardiac output management may be uh, required uh, to maintain specific cardiac output goals of 3.3 uh, to 6 liters per minute per meter square. The last option, at least in, uh, the, de in the developed world, is uh, ECMO. Uh, I know that that's not a readily available option in Pakistan, but uh, uh, hopefully uh, one day it will be. In neonates, in addition to the other things that we just talked about, uh, these uh, neonates can certainly have um, congenital heart disease mimicking uh, sepsis. And so uh, it is important uh, in these children to consider adding prostaglandin because they may have ductal dependent lesions, either uh, ductal dependent pulmonary artery circulation or uh, ductal dependent uh, systemic circulation. Uh, and so just remember to always in neonates always add um, uh, or at least think of prostaglandins as uh, potential uh, therapy. Uh, again, in neonates, uh, there are other modes of uh, cardiac uh, monitoring, such as doing ultrasounds to assess SVC flow or to measure cardiac, uh, cardiac index or cardiac output. Um, and Again, in uh, neonates, uh, uh, they also uh, use hydrocortisone, but you can also consider using uh, thyroid hormone supplementation uh, for children presenting in, uh, in shock. The next important piece is initiation of antibiotics. So as, uh, as quickly as you can, but uh, most studies show that if you give the antibiotics within one hour of identification of severe sepsis, then you have better, uh, better outcomes. Certainly if you delay antibiotic administration beyond three hours uh, after presentation, that is an independent risk factor for mortality. Um, and you should rule out abscesses. Additional uh, management concerns center around uh, these patients who may require mechanical ventilation. Uh, you have to tube feed uh, these children and they will not be able to eat. Um, and if they, if you're not able to tube feed you, then you may have to arrange for uh, total parental nutrition. Uh, certainly have to keep a very close eye on their kidney function and fluid management. Uh, these patients may end up requiring uh, some period of dialysis support uh, if they, uh, if their kidneys take a hit. Uh, glucose control is also uh, essential. Uh, they can develop hyperglycemia and hyperglycemia also so is an independent factor for mortality in children uh, and adults, uh, and therefore control, controlling uh, glucose levels to uh, normal uh, levels, uh, close to normal levels is also important. Similarly, we talked about uh, transfusion for uh, keeping hemoglobin levels at a certain level, especially if the cardiac output is diminished, uh, but they may also require other blood component therapies uh, such as platelets uh, or uh, fresh frozen plasma if they are having bleeding complications. Other therapies that are uh, commonly used are uh, listed here. Uh, steroids, uh, certainly we use a lot of them. Uh, the other therapies that I have listed here are much less commonly used, uh, except for maybe IVIG or intravenous immunoglobulin, which is uh, used mostly uh, when we are thinking of uh, neonates or uh, children who may have uh, syndromes uh, such as Kawasaki disease or other such entities where you give IVIG. Uh, the complications associated with sepsis include, uh, like I said uh, earlier, multi-organ uh, 
failure or multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. Uh, there are other more specific types of um, complications such as uh, thrombocytopenia associated multi-organ uh, dysfunction. Uh, and then there is also um, a multi-organ dysfunction, uh, which includes uh, uh, syndromes uh, such as uh, HLH and MAS. Uh, both of these again have uh, gain, uh, gained increased um, notoriety or attention uh, with COVID as uh, ch uh, both children and adults with uh, COVID are thought to uh, have um, HLH or MAS, at least the ones that have severe COVID disease. So future of uh, sepsis research uh, uh, is uh, moving towards trying to assess the risk for sepsis in patients who present uh, early so that we can, if we can identify those who are at a higher risk for uh, disease, then we can uh, treat them uh, quicker and try and uh, uh, hit them harder with uh, various therapies. Uh, uh, so that's where uh, in the next few years, uh, hopefully we'll, there'll be a lot of progress. But I just, in the end, wanted to just thank the uh, Jenison Medical University uh, Alumni Association of North America for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you. Uh, and thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, this is my email. Uh, feel free to uh, send me an email. I'll be more than happy to uh, correspond or talk to you if you want. So thank you very much.